okay, I just, so the first thing in my mind is don't ask me any questions when I'm speaking. Save them all, save them all up for afterwards. And the second thing that's really on my mind is I feel an absolute fraud because I've been so inspired with the projects that I visited here in, in Denmark in these la last two days that I think, God, you've wasted your money bringing me here. But <laughs> So, you know, I'm just going to try and make up for it. And uh, the other weird thing is I could be genetically Danish because uh, the most expensive item of clothing I own are my shoes, which are Danish. And uh, everything I've seen has made my eyes hurt. The beauty and the... I don't know, there's something very lovely about being here. So you might be fed up with Denmark, but I'm loving it. <laughs> so um, I'm going to talk really fast, but I've taken guidance from Thor, who says Danish people are so clever, it really doesn't matter if you speak fast. So I'm just saying that he said it was OK. So I'm just going to... Um, I'm going to tell you the incredible edible story. And it's just a story of active citizens in a small town, a poor town in northern England. Uh, this is our town. It's very unusual because I see your flat here. So it's in the middle of three very steep valleys with a microclimate of rain, sleet, and rain. <laughs> and it was once, look at these big buggers, it was once a stinking rich industrial weaving town 200 years ago. When weaving stopped in uh, England, obviously there was no industry left and it's now a poor town. And just to give you an example of what I mean by a poor town, if you were to buy a house about here, Two bedrooms, stone house, a nice house, £50,000. So you can do that sum in Danish money. But £50,000 would not buy you the door of a garage in London or the south of England. So it's a northern town, it's a poor town with a microclimate that's shit. And uh, it's also, it's got a mosque a Muslim community, a Polish community, and high unemployment. But it's also unbelievably beautiful when the sun shines. So about, um, well it was, 2008, a group of people came together who were really worried about stuff. Because um, in 2008 what happened, there was a volcano in Iceland that created a dust cloud that stopped planes flying. So people started to think, oh, what? We can't get beans from Africa? We'll starve in England. <laughs> in 2008, the bankers uh, were being very naughty. In 2008, pubs, shops, factories were clo closing all over England. And it was a really difficult time. And personally, I'm a grandmother for 12 children, so I know that my grandchildren will never go to university for free. You have to pay a lot of money. They'll never own their own houses, and they'll never find it easy to get a job. So some of us think we owe, we owe some payback to a generation that's not going to have it as good as we did. So a lot of people were worried about what was happening. And when you're worried, you could do um, different things. You can drink a lot of red wine and blame Europe, the Americans, the police, young people, immigrants. Or you can say, I'm going to get off my backside. I'm going to be active and do something. And we thought, excuse me, we'll do something. We'll, we'll We'll make something happen in our town to make it cleaner, greener, stronger, kinder. And for people to take us seriously, because, and you know, especially Danish people, which we didn't know was going to happen, we need a model. So we thought, let's make a model that's really easy because we haven't got an office or a printer or any staff. We'll make a model that you can see it once and remember it. So this is our model. 
Uh, these are plates because there's a food thing going on here. We thought if you do three things, you might stand a chance to make a difference in your town, city, commune, whatever it is, you might make a difference. Do some stuff with community, anything that combats loneliness, that brings people together and is quite fun. Help local businesses. Now that's a tough one, especially if you're like me and you haven't got a job and you're thinking, why should I help local businesses? Well, if we don't, children will grow up without a prospering town. So we wanted to do as much as possible to shop local and support small businesses. And learning. Learning, if you think learning is just for teachers, then you're crazy because learning requires around the clock approach because so much of learning is the government's agenda. So the birds and the bees and the soil and the starving people of Africa are not really the government's agenda. So they're the three things we thought we'd do. And I'm going to talk to you about some of, just give you some examples. But we needed a membership and we needed a thing to, to focus on. And we thought, we'll focus on food. We'll focus on growing food eating food, because it's lovely, sharing food, learning about it, and all of that stuff, because we'll be able to help with learning, businesses, and community. And the brilliant thing about food is so brilliant. It crosses culture, class, age, and creed. So whether you can't speak a flipping word of English, this woman is most probably the best chapati maker in the world, and this woman is most probably the best, I don't know, sausage maker in the world. It doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, everybody has got something to say about food, which helps with the membership, because this is our membership. If you eat, you're in. So that means there's no paperwork, which we really don't like paperwork too much. So we thought we'd use food as the glue for our community. We'd use food as a direct effect for kindness. And we'd use actions, not words. We wouldn't ask a consultant to write a document. We wouldn't knock on doors and say, what do you think about this idea? We'd just get on and do it. We thought we'd use all the resources of the community because every community everywhere, whether it's a refugee camp or a, a city block has got skilled people. People that could dig, people that have got a memory about the old days, people that can cook, and they've always got people that can eat. We'd use our own resources. And sometimes you've just got to do it. You know, the longer you talk about stuff, the more scared you get. Has anyone done it before? Did they fail? Was it good? What are the statistics? We really are not interested in any of that stuff. I'm not saying it's wrong, but we personally don't give much for it. We really wanted to reconnect with our landscape. We wanted children to grow up in a landscape that, that talked to them about the seasons, about the birds, the bees, about the importance of food, so that you could really learn from your landscape. And we thought we'll try anything. We really don't care. I mean, the craziest idea, we'll just go for it. And if it doesn't work and it hasn't cost anything, we're not bothered. We also thought, you need to be a bit brave. We've all got a bit soppy. You know, we've all let somebody else be brave and not be brave ourselves to look stupid and people laugh at us. We're just gonna be brave. But the really good news for England, I don't know how it is for you, is the prisons are full. And that is such good news because uh, no, there's nothing you can't do. If the prisons are full, they don't wanna be, um, picking up any of us. So that was a, a great relief to all of us. So I'm just gonna show you, it's a plate thing, a food thing going on under the community plate, some things that we really love. So this is very important to us. We grow food in public places not to feed a town. We're growing food to demonstrate kindness. We're growing food to demonstrate the seasons, the soil, the bugs, the birds, the bees, and community glue. And 
Sometimes we've had to take the council's land. I'm sorry, council, but this is what we say. Sometimes it's better to ask for forgiveness than hang about waiting for permission. We could have waited six months for the council to say, yeah, yeah, you can dig up the roses and put in cabbages. So sometimes you just have to do it. Um, and the beautiful thing about growing in a public space is you're growing trust because people go, oh, they're crazy. They're planting food and anyone can take it. There'll be none. Well, actually, humans are hardwired to be kind and trusting. And we've engaged with a lot of groups. So churches have got a rule book called the Bible. It's full of stuff about food and feeding people. So we've encouraged churches, do the right thing. Get some food in your churchyard. Um, another thing we really love, we don't like a guerrilla gardening because it's full of machismo and essence of war and macho-ness. So we like to say naughty but nice. So uh, this is our health centre. It cost millions of pounds and it was planted with an architect's planting plan of poisonous prickly plants. And we used to go in at night and sneak in and dig them out and put our own things in. And then you can see I'm not cut out for sneaking around at night and I'm busy. So I went to see the doctors and said, shouldn't the patients pick apples on the way in, plums on the way out? They said, brilliant, but we're not going to pay for it. So. It took a long time, it took a lot of money, but the whole of our health centre is filled with apples, rhubarb, plums, berries, and it's open to the public the whole time, so there's no fences. And out of the back, this was just a piece of land at the back of the health centre, we created a medicinal herb garden. So, and also we built benches for the doctors and nurses just to take a break in nature. This is our police station here, look, and um, it's south facing and in a dark deep valley there's not much south land. So we're growing corn here, not because corn grows well in damp, because it's funny, because we like to say cop corn. And uh, so sometimes we grow things for serious reasons and sometimes we just grow them for the hell of it. And uh, it's beautiful, the police love it, people coming into their their property picking vegetables. And uh, men in uniform, I know it's sexist to say, but I, I am sexist, um, they can be very competitive. So this is the firemen. They said, oh, the police have got stuff, we want stuff. <laughs> so they're planting cherry trees there. This is the car park of the railway station where we grow cabbages and potatoes. And this is on the platform, we've got 13 of these tubs uh, pick your own herbs so you can just take your scissors uh, and pick them on the way home from work. And this is the job centre. What's lovely about the railway station is they said, Mary, those pots are very heavy. They could stop a train. Uh, if one of them went on the, the track, hundreds of people will be killed. And I said, don't worry, they're glued down with special station glue. So if anyone needs any, I've got it. <laughs> a, a, a really lovely thing that we love, this is a recent little harvest festival, is all we're about, really. So I'm bluffing, that's why I feel a phony here. It's just about conversations. It's just about a whole load of people getting together and just talking with each other. Because that is where any change is going to start. We're really so into simple pleasures. This is the most popular stall that we have, and it only does two things, bread and jam. And this old lady will be saying, I remember my great-grandmother, she made a jam that was better than this jam, and he'll say, ah, oh, but my wife's jam was the very, very best. And all of those conversations are like gold to us. And we've also, over the years, realized that it costs nothing. The really simple things, uh, iPads, tech, people are mesmerized by squeezing an apple, mesmerized and queue up all day to turn a handle. It's madness. And we've got very good at lots of things about parades and celebrations and involving children because, well, they're cute, aren't they? <laughs> 
And we really, again, I, you, I can't say enough how the simple stuff works. This man is all he's doing is making wooden spoons. But for five hours, people will queue to watch a man make a wooden spoon. So if that's all the world is needing, really simple stuff, uh, we can all do it. So under the heading of, am I all right for time? I'm, I'll just keep going. Blow it. So not only children don't know anything about the soil and the land and where food comes from, but adults as well. So it's really important. You could learn by just looking. These are the apples at the health centre. You could hear people say, I've never seen an apple on a tree. How would you see an apple in a tree in a valley like we've got? We've actually planted a thousand trees now, but it's so important that people learn when do apples grow? They don't grow at Christmas. Interacting with our landscape. Look, you can taste the landscape. This is just near a car park where fennel and herbs and, and people stop and have a chew and offer it to their friend. We've done a lot of things like cooking in the street. For those people who aren't going to go to a college or a restaurant, we can go to them and just cook with them and talk with them. We also like danger because so many children nowadays are sheltered. These boys in their culture don't go in a kitchen and they've got a knife and they spent hours just using a knife, being, being the guys to chop the apples. So in school now, oh, we can't let anyone have a knife. It's too dangerous. So uh, we, we like a little bit of danger. And we like the streets to be a classroom because there's, there's something to learn every day when you're just walking about. We've got six primary schools and one secondary school. This is a tennis court that's been chopped up to make communal growing beds. Because when you're hungry, tennis is crap. <laughs> this is trees. As I told you, there's no culture of gardening in the little valley. And an awful lot of people um, would love to have uh, fruit trees. And we used to buy them, but we've learned to make them. And it's, it's just such an amazing, people feel so great doing, is all you need is a sharp knife and plasters for all the injuries you're going to get. <laughs> but uh, it's a great activity. And just, you don't need to pay to go to a cookery club. You just get someone who's got a big kitchen. And she says, if you want to learn to make this, come to my house. Businesses, it's a little bit tougher helping them. So one of the first things we did was buy a present for all the local people that just said, how far, we said right on there where your food comes from. And they thought, oh, these are crazy hippies, but we'll please them anyway, we'll do it. And then they realized that people want to buy food that they can see. If they can see that cow, on a hill five miles away, they're, they're more likely to buy it than it's been floated from, I don't know, somewhere else. And we've encouraged dozens of businesses to grow by starting off with small, really small, and then just growing and growing. And there are dozens of new companies set up in our town now, making beer, breeding pigs, oh, in competition with Denmark, jam, cheese, or, I mean, this guy here, he was a computer programmer with depression, and he thought, shit, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave before I kill myself, and I'm gonna make cheese. And now he's got even more depression, because it's the only organic cheese in our valley, so he, he can't keep up with the orders all the time, so it's not always a happy ending. <laughs> but we also created employment. It, it wasn't easy. Those of us in the group that had the skills, that wanted to do it, went off and created two not-for-profit companies, teaching horticulture, aquaponics, permaculture, and employing young people who can grow food in the future. So this is the incredible farm. It was just a wasteland like this, and it's now a permaculture growing and training center. And this uh, cost a million. This is uh, teaching the science of the soil and water, which is based in a school. So just to say about money, for us, for our group, the, the town group, 
It's all an experiment. We didn't want to have staff. We didn't want offices. We didn't want public funding because we thought when the shit really hits the fan, which it surely will, um, 2008 was the beginning of a banking crisis. There will be in our lifetime another one. And then what will happen? All the good things will stop? Well, they're not going to stop for us because we're not interested in doing it the normal way. We're interested in experimenting to see how far and how much can we do with our own resources. And part of that is we were just lucky and really good stuff happened. And part of the good stuff is vegetable tourism. So people started coming from all over the world. Oh, we want to look at vegetables. Take note, not a leaf on the tree. Don't come. We don't want you to come. There's nothing to see. Ah, oh, but we really want to come. So we thought, we're going to capitalize on this business. And we created a map around the town where the parts of the town, ours is a drive through town. You don't stop and visit our town. So we created a little map to, of really beautiful points in the town and made interesting things, thinking that if you bought a cup of coffee here, a sandwich there, those tiny amounts of money would gradually drip, drip, drip into the local economy and help local business. So we've created a beautiful uh, route around the town. We've installed enormous, beautiful um, bird boxes and bat houses and just created a nice edible walk that tells the story of bees and pollination. We've been, you can't see it, but we've installed amazing uh, artworks along on the walls. But uh, we did forget planning permission and we did forget to consult. So we thought, we'll ask the police to launch it and then nobody will, <laughs> it'll all be all right, which it was. Thank you, we love our police. And then he came, which was really good, because he said to me, he said to me, Mary, when I'm king, take any land I've got and do what you like. So, that was nice. He was, he was, he was good to say that. And we felt more confident. And then all of a sudden, other people started saying, could we be incredible? Well. Everybody's incredible. Of course you could be incredible. So all of these little sprouts are little uh, projects because, so I just want to be clear, there's no judgment. So we're doing it without money. Incredible Edible Lambeth in London has six million pounds. We're not saying we're doing it the right way. I would most probably say you've been shortchanged with me. There'd be a lot better groups in the country, but we're doing it our way because that's how we like to be. We, we want to be a bit more edgy about it. And everyone's doing it different because there is no office, there are still no staff, and nobody's counting. Oh, someone's making maps. I don't know how they do it. <laughs> but. Um, uh, uh, the French are a little bit crazy because they really love it. And then uh, lots of places in Africa and Morocco and Israel and Palestine. So it's, it is really beautiful to know that it's uh, spread all over the world. But we haven't really got the time to pay that much attention. Oh, I, I paid this attention because, you know, I'd, I'd be a liar if I didn't say when I see our logo there in front of the parliament in Quebec, my heart does skip a beat. And I do feel really, I just think, how did that happen? A bunch of grannies in Todmorden and, you know, they're planting up their parliament and they've got our little logo there. So, you know, we are very proud, but also not that bothered. Um, I, I'm more bothered by these guys. I think, you know, uh, those tiny little things are so important. The small stuff is so important. And um, Henrik said to me, normally nobody tells me what to say, but he had a list. He said, could you cover the next steps? What your next steps? Well, as we are just making it all up, I thought, wow, I'll have to make up something or think of something. So uh, it was a good question and I thank him for it because it made me think, what, are I, what is the future? 
while I'm still the chairperson. Uh, I think we want to remain self-funded and keep on this journey of discovery of how car far can you go on your own energy. We want to continue to dream that things are possible and that we can do anything. We want to take risks and we definitely want to make more mistakes because uh, that's my experience in life. Make plenty of mistakes and learn plenty of stuff. At the moment, uh, we're just learning about death. So as a group, one of our comrades was ill and we've all nursed him and, and he's gone now. But doing that, we learned so much about, God, the state has not only taken our land, but it's all also controlled how we die. So we've all learned how to do nursing stuff to dress the body, buy the coffin and, and send people off in a way they want to, because even Google, let me tell you, has a beautiful film, YouTube, on how to dig the grave. So it's all very easy. So we're very interested in the death stuff as well, because growing and dying are all part of that mix of community. So there isn't a boundary that stops at a saucepan. You know, if some, one of us is gonna die, shit, we better learn all about dying and see what we can do to make it better. Um, I just want to say what we believe in. We believe in joy, absolutely. Because without joy, there's no money involved, so no one's gonna come along. We believe in community. We believe that is the only place where people will find happiness and joy and comfort is in safe in a community. And we believe anything's possible, absolutely anything. Very important, time is short. This is not a dress rehearsal, you know, Really, life is so short, you've just got to get up there and give it your best shot. And we believe the planet is in trouble, big trouble. Maybe um, some countries feel it more than others, but my God, I don't have a television because I would be crazy with a television because the news that is saturating the world, the shit, the misery, the murder and violence is so terrible. So the planet is in trouble and we do need action, not words. We believe people have power, absolute power. And we believe in the power of small actions. You don't have to believe it, but I've seen it, trust me. I've seen the power of joining together a whole bunch of small actions to make a bigger, better thing. And we believe in kindness. We believe science will not fix the trouble we're in. We believe politics will do nothing for the current situation and money for sure is not the answer. We believe kindness is the answer and um, using kindness we reckon we can grow a better future. That's it.